thank you so much for inviting us to take part in this. We're really happy to be here. And I'm going to start off by just introducing ourselves a little bit more. So we do architecture and we do interior design, but as a practice, we are extremely holistic. So as the last question just touched upon, it's in all our projects, we really try to bring in all the disciplines from architecture, interior design, product design, and graphic design. Um, so we do a lot of customization, a lot of bespoke uh, pieces. So we currently have two studios. Briar is based in Hong Kong, I'm based in Shanghai. Um, and we work globally on different um, scales, different typologies. But fundamentally for us, the most important thing is design. Um, so every project is different. We are very contextually driven, narratives. Um, we really seek deep into the, the brief, the context, the location, to really find a nuance that will make every project special. So today we're gonna focus more on the Shanghai side of our work. Uh, so this is some images of our studio in Shanghai and also some of the images that the architectural photographer Mark Goodwin took when he came to visit us. So he was really fascinated by the little laneways that you still see in Shanghai and also the sort of really active um, streets around where you see the sort of moving of objects. And for us, I've been in Shanghai for 10 years. This is the part of Shanghai that I love, and I, you know, that's what keeps me there. And also, these are sort of the things that really inspire us, and that we really try to incorporate these kind of thoughts, observations um, from everyday life into our work. So in Shanghai at the moment, it's always been a city that has this incredible fusion between East and West. In the 1920s, you had this period where you had, you know, great Western influence in trade and, you know, in art, architecture, fashion, the way people behaved. Um, it was this huge melting pot. And today there are these remnants of different styles of architecture. And sadly, you know, we see the demolition of these old laneways. So whilst you can reflect on that, we always try to sort of maybe extract memories or preserve the memory of what these spaces, these buildings would have been into our projects. So for example, the one in the middle, you know, this is like something that you would see from a half demolished building and you start to reveal how these buildings were put together with these different kinds of bricks that have just seemingly been stuffed into a hole. Also the bottom image here on the left, this was the street artist JR who came to Shanghai in a a photo project called Wrinkles, where he wheat pasted images of older residents. But he chose these kind of demolition sites for the location of these projects. So for us, it's kind of about finding beauty and opportunity from this kind of um, chaos. So the first one is uh, WeWork Way High Road. So most of you probably know WeWork. They've been in the press a lot recently. But when we started working with them about four years ago, they had many offices in the US, they had many offices in Europe, but they were just starting in Asia. So their style was very much uh, focused on the communal aspect of offices. Um, it wasn't this very traditional kind of model of what an office looked like. We were so fortunate to be allowed to work on this building in the middle of Jing'an in Shanghai. It has a really rich history. It's a historic building at the turn of the century. You can see it in the middle picture. It used to be an opium factory, then it became an ammunition storehouse, and then was used as artist uh, studios. So actually in this picture, that's when it was artist studios, and you can actually see they've infilled the courtyard with, a, with another building. It was actually surrounded by this uh, laneway, which we call Nongtang in Shanghainese. This is the very typical Shanghainese residential typology where you have these laneways and you have shared sinks and cooking facilities. So it's a very communal way of living. In Shanghai, people live their lives in quite an open, performative way. You can sort of see them carrying out their rituals throughout the day. And also the architecture, of course, is inspired or it's uh, influenced by the West as well. So I guess taking all of these aspects, uh, the community aspect and also the mix of East and West was something that was really key for this WeWork project. This was the existing building. So this was very unloved. It was empty, abandoned for five years before we started. 
So you can see the beautiful old uh, facade, but unfortunately the previous landlord had built this really unsympathetic industrial addition, which just really didn't marry at all with the rich architecture. We didn't even think about office typology when we first started thinking about what this building was going to look like. We wanted to reference this kind of Belle Epoque period from the 1920s that was all about fun, festivity, and kind of make it almost like a grand hotel rather than an office. Um, and that's very much part of the WeWork brand. You know, they don't want you to feel like you're, you're going to work. They want you to feel like you're going somewhere really special and that you, your day is, doesn't feel like work. We were also really inspired by this image from the Grand Budapest Hotel by Wes Anderson. Just this idea of balconies and being able to look down and watch what's really happening. Um, so this idea of spectator and performer as well was something that we really wanted to include in the project. Just to explain the party of the project, the grey is the existing U-shaped heritage building. Uh, the light grey is this new ugly building. What we had in the middle was this pink communal space um, and we always knew that the focus of the whole design, the whole building had to be in this space. Um, we inserted two new bridges and a new staircase to improve the circulation and I guess to like emphasize this concept of spectator performer. Um, the staircase wasn't just a means of circulation, it was an extension of uh, this, like a, a place where people could sit, stand and watch what was going on. And also these two new bridges basically allowed circulation all around the building. This was the final project. So you can see we inserted this terrazzo tray into what we call this main courtyard space. And we call it the stage, basically. So it's a very flexible space. During the day, it's normally set up like this for hot desking and formal meetings. But they've had numerous events here from yoga classes to magic shows, banquet dinners, um, talks, so on. We inserted the new staircase, which you can see, and we also ripped off the old balustrade and put this leaner in that actually has a desk behind, so you can actually sit there all along this perimeter watching what's going on. And of course there's a bar where they give you free beer all day long. <laughs> um, we inserted this new lighting installation as well. We kind of didn't really want to engage with this skylight above but be more engaged with the existing architecture, so we decided to suspend it from the red brick walls. Um, so we custom designed this just simply out of grey and pink electrical cabling. And basically it was to give the space uh, a sense of domesticity because this is a very tall atrium space. So what I think what's really successful about this um, is when you're actually in the space, you can see it from below, you can see straight through it, or you can see it from above. And it's always kind of giving you a different uh, perception of it just due to its like three-dimensional nature. Um, this is looking back, so this is the back of the bar. Um, so we also lined this terrazzo tray with this um, brass rail um, to allow us to incorporate lighting, to hang artwork and accessories, again, to sort of give it that domestic scale. Graphically as well, we knew that the terrazzo tray had to be extremely impactful from above, so we created this uh, pattern. So you can see here, we created this pattern out of the pink, the blue, and the green and gray um, terrazzo. So half of it was in situ, half of it was uh, precast. So here you can see our project architect throwing the first pebbles into the terrazzo as a sign of good luck. And then another smaller scale shot of kind of how we incorporated artwork and lighting into it. So we always try to be extremely holistic about the way things are detailed and how we're trying to tell the story. Um, also, all the furniture was specifically chosen to again have this kind of domestic feel. So to talk more about the staircase, uh, it was designed to be a very sculptural object. Uh, we clad the balustrade in these timber triangles. One side was painted blue, one side was left timber. And we had a gradient of about 30 blue colors. So as it is this very sculptural um, form, as you move around it, it's constantly shifting from wood to blue, from dark blue to light blue. Um, and here are just some images of it being installed on site. So one of the things that was really problematic with the existing building was the really drab grey colour. So we painted everything this uh, ivy green colour to make the concept of this grand hotel, this very festive space, really holistic and clear. And that's the final staircase. Again, if we talk about narrative and sort of carrying that throughout the whole project, for us, the graphics for this was so important. 
So we did a lot of custom work uh, throughout. So for example, the pantries, we did this neon that was in this really fun fan shape. The community manager's desk, that was what we conceived as the concierge in the hotel. So we had this ring for service neon. We also did a lot of custom wallpapers for all the meeting rooms. So here you can see some of the different versions and you can also see one of the finished rooms. Actually, one interesting point is that in the building, there was an existing wood floor which we couldn't retain because of fire reasons. So instead, we actually put it as wainscoting in the meeting rooms, uh, creating these kind of chevron patterns. So another really fun area was we had a big back pantry and we decided to sort of, again, pay homage to these like 1920s ladies. Um, that has the sort of, from the posters, um, that have the traditional chung sums on, but kind of bring in the WeWork ethos of like, you know, these kind of slogans and bringing them up to the 20th century. So giving them Beats by Dre, headphones and pints of beer. So again, this was kind of like a fun thing that we developed and again had artists on site paint. So a lot of these slogans are very sort of WeWork. You know, it's all about motivating people. For the bathrooms, we custom made tiles, so we played with this, these sort of really geometric shapes and lines to create this very parlor-esque feeling. So it's a very sort of striking, memorable bathroom. Also, we wanted to reference its past being an opium factory, but again, you kind of have to be a bit sensitive and do it in a subtle but clever way. So these are um, murals that we developed, um, talking about the poppies. So. On one floor, the poppies were open, and on the other floor, they were closed. And again, we got artists to hand paint these dots to give it this kind of more handmade feel. So that was one of the poppies installed in the pantry. Also, to talk about the laneway for Miguel, the founder, I think how people approached the building was super important. And um, he kind of wanted to create this moment of shock that people would walk past this laneway and see something that would really surprise them. So we painted the whole thing pink. We cast a pink concrete floor. Uh, and then on this old Chinese arch at the end, they put a, a neon sign that says, the hustle never ends. And this has become a bit of an Instagram spot. And I guess also just finish talking about this project. When we talk about working with existing buildings, uh, it's incredibly rewarding, but it's a, a fluid process, so we would literally be going to site every two days, and every time we would go, we would discover something new. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad, but it meant that you had to really adapt your design, be very sort of fluid with it, and it took an incredible amount of teamwork. So this is us on the last day when it was all finished, and three people trying to install one light on site. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you Ting Tai Tea House, which is a project in Shanghai as well. The client is Chinese and he has a, a love for tea. Um, so he wanted to create a very elevated experience for people to come and drink tea over a matter of hours, being a very slow procession. The site is located in an area in Shanghai called um, M50, which is um, kind of the art district of Shanghai. It's uh, a form of textile um, factories. Over the years, it's been converted into art galleries and exhibition spaces and cafes. So our site was one of these buildings within this district. So this is the space when we started the project. It was an art gallery, so everything was painted white. And what we really wanted to do was try to sort of uncover the history of the space and to really like peel back the layers and that would be something that would help us to inform what we were going to do within the space. So we removed all the Dutch work from the ceiling and then we just started to strip all the layers back, the paint back and on the floor, on the columns and on the walls. So this is just a section to sort of describe the existing condition. Above you can see that there's this double height space on the right which had this existing mezzanine in there. It was, had a very low ceiling height so actually it was not really usable as a space. And it had these clear stories at high level, so what we really wanted to do was demolish that and open the space up and bring the natural light down into the lower level area. So this is actually that mezzanine floor, so we had started to strip the paint back and expose the concrete. Um, and then you can see this existing slab was there, and on the left we, yeah, we demolished that, and this was the result on the right where you created this sort of tall vertical space. 
And after pulling back the layers, you can see we exposed these concrete columns and beams. On the ceiling, we discovered this really nice um, patchwork of brickwork and on the walls as well. And also the image on the top right are some of the bricks which had the manufacturer's embossing of their name in the bricks. Through this process of revealing and deconstructing the site, it started to inform our material palette, <laughs> this being the raw concrete and the brick. And our decisions from what we were going to do forward from that were really based on what we sort of encountered. This is the staircase space as well. So again, just stripping back the plaint and uncovering the layers and showing the history of the building. So this is a, um, the floor plan of our proposal for the tea house. This is the first floor plan. So you enter on ground floor in the staircase and you come up and then you arrive. Uh, in the centre you have this large communal space. And then around the perimeter we have a series of tea houses which sort of read as these separate insertions. On the ones on the left, these are actually double height. So the plan on the right shows you the three um, tea houses which are elevated. So in between these tea houses, we wanted to create these spaces which operated as circulation, but also had these sort of internal gardens which the tea houses looked out upon. When we started this, we wanted to really be sensitive to this existing building and everything we wanted to do as a new insertion to re detach from the building. And this is um, actually during construction, so these are the elevated plat um, tea houses. So it was really like working with the existing beams and being very sensitive to the existing structure. So this is actually a final um, image of the double height tea houses. So you can see how they're working with the existing structure and have this detachment from the existing fabric of the building. Another really important element of this project actually was this idea of um, privacy and um, yeah, being seen and not being seen. So the top tea houses are very voyeuristic. You're very sort of exposed in your procession of drinking tea. Whereas in the lower tea houses, you sort of sit in this sunken landscape and a tatami style table. So this is an image on the left um, showing you the main communal space um, and these double height tea houses which uh, fill this vertic vertical space. And you can see on the right, this is during construction and this detachment from the building itself. The paving we just wanted to use, uh, like one material, so we used this uh, green terrazzo and all the mechanical was stored in there and it also became something that you could occupy. So you can sit in this landscape and drink tea, um, it has these sort of niches for guard, um, sort of rock gardens and it also becomes areas of circulation. This is just a side view of one of the tea houses. So from the outside, the material palette was this sort of reflective brushed stainless steel and we really wanted that to contrast to the sort of rawness and the roughness of the of the concrete and then when you enter the tea house it's all clad in timber. So this is an image of the lower level tea houses so really playing with this idea of public versus private so when you sit in these tea houses you have a very sort of open perspective to the communal space. We also played with uh, cutting these volumes so that it opened up to the ceiling above and you could see the existing structure on the ceiling. So on the opposite side, there's the single story tea houses. And again, it's a different typology of drinking tea where you're sitting at table height. So it's a much more internalized experience. It's more about the people in the room and them sharing the experience together rather than uh, looking out to, towards the communal space. This is um, just looking down from above. So you can really see how we played with this terrazzo, a very monolithic material to create this sort of hardscape landscape. So this is actually um, when you're entering the building, it's um, from the street, so we wanted to create a really sort of strong threshold between the street and your journey of actually being transported up into the tea house. So we demolished the entrance and we actually cut this window to make it bigger. And then we inserted this green metal structure between it was this white nougat and it became a framework which suspended the white terrazzo. So it was really sort of creating this element of surprise that you're sort of transported up the staircase and your next experience of the tea house is something completely different. The client actually is an avid collector of Chinese artifacts and artworks. And I think it's just a really nice kind of marriage between something that's really modern, something that references sort of Chinese culture and heritage and the building itself and talking about the history of the building and where it came from. Um, the next project I'm going to talk about, it's a really small project, a really low budget. It had to be built in like three weeks. It was extremely fast. It was actually one of our first projects. Um, and I think it's you know really enjoyable to do projects like this because it makes you be really responsive um, to the site. 
and to be really creative in terms of what you do to do something like really interesting and smart and impactful, but um, yeah, just be clever with materials and what you can work with. This is actually the site, which, you know, doesn't look that interesting. It's in the French concession in Shanghai, which is in a residential district. It was only uh, 18, 19 square metres. Um, and the, the brief for this job was to create a streetwear shop. So when we started this project, we basically just stripped everything away. One thing we really thought about when we were doing this project is how can we work with perspective to sort of emphasise the product and what's on display and sort of challenge people's perception as they're walking by to be sort of invited to walk into the space. So this is actually the floor plan. You can see it's, it's really small and it's quite deep. Just a really simple sort of concept, working with these very uh, linear lines, which were tilted at an angle. At the back, it, it's like full length and then it slowly sort of dissipates in length as you move to the front of the um, elevation of the shop. Um, it was quite a challenge because it has a lot of um, program. It needed a changing room, a toilet, storage, retail display and a cashier. So in doing this between each sort of linear display, we put the storage in between. This is how it actually turned out. So through this process of revealing all the sort of existing fabric of the building, we had some nice surprises, one of which was this kind of ornamental uh, Chinese detail on the um, facade. And I guess another thing that we really wanted to think about was when people were passing by, we didn't want to have this very like closed barrier between the street and the shop. So again, the glazing was kind of put on this angle to extend the outside to the inside. And it's really nice because it's a streetwear shop. There's, you know, guys who are skaters that come to the store and they sort of just hang out here and it becomes kind of this nice social space between the street and the shop. So we, again, it was built really fast. It was like very simple in terms of construction and also um, materiality. So we only used three materials, mirror, white metal and polished stainless steel. So this image is showing you the, um, the vertical planes, which become the display system, and then the mirror in between, which is where the storage is. And I guess re another reason why we wanted to work with mirror was, again, express the existing concrete shell and uh, also to reflect the street coming into the interior. One thing that was kind of interesting was that there was this little window that we had at the back, because this is in a residential neighbourhood. And in playing with these mirrors that actually you got a reflection of the neighbor's bathroom into the shop, which the neighbor wasn't very happy about. But we always kind of like that, right? Like to celebrate what's happening in the surroundings and these sort of uh, domestic rituals which are happening on the streets. But we had to frost it, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's it. So actually we're just gonna show you a video now that we did with uh, Herschel Supply, who's a client of ours from Vancouver. We've been working with them doing a retail strategy I think throughout the best Asia. The way to experience Shanghai is by bike, um, explore the streets and get lost. And that's when you actually see the real Shanghai and um, find the most interesting things. So my name is Briar Hickling. I'm from New Zealand. <laughs> My name is Alex Block. I'm half Swedish, half Chinese. And we're the co-founders of Linehouse, um, an interior and architecture design company based in Asia. My favourite part of what we do, creating architecture in Shanghai, is actually going to the construction sites and slowly seeing projects being realised. Well, this is one of our projects under construction. This is a tea house. This used to be an old uh, factory. So we just stripped the whole space, took out this uh, level that was up here and created these double height houses and set it into this um, vertical space. We're very hands-on. We will go to site weekly, but it's these small kind of changes every time you go that really gives you the sort of satisfaction. Our office is located in Jing'an of Shanghai, which is in the north. This is kind of an area that's um, slowly becoming cool and active. Especially where we are, it's always been an area that the artists have seen as something affordable. Um, a lot of people have opened little workshops and studios here. I think what really inspires us in Shanghai is this like constant blurring between the public and private. So for us that was always really um, kind of beautiful and poetic, you know, this sort of performative nature of the, the city streets. So we're just walking down one of the old 
Longtangs, the Shanghainese example of historical residential laneways. You have this one shared public laneway where you have shared sinks. So this is a very public area, how people live their lives, perform everyday rituals. When visitors come to Shanghai, one of the places that we always want to take them to is the Long Museum. So this used to be a bridge which was used for the transportation of coal. So there used to be actually uh, railway tracks here, and this is where the coal would drop down into, into the train line. So it's quite nice because it's nestled in between uh, this museum, so you've got this really nice tension between the old and, and the new. One of the really interesting elements of the Hesho office was the doorway when you enter the office. Uh, we wanted the, this living room space to operate as an extension of the street. So you can open up the door, it fully pivots, and this structure is opened up to the main way. Travel has become one of those essential parts of our work, and it's also something that we really enjoy. Usually we travel together, so we're able to like, really explore cities in a much more fun way. We're always trying to find like the secret hidden gems in every place that we go to. We've been living abroad for so long that we have this network like all around the world. You can really experience a city as a local rather than as a, as a tourist, as a traveller. Yeah. It's all about discovering. Oh, thank you so much, Alex and Bria.